mention a little bit different category than what we've talked about before. So as we mentioned, op amps, uh, all of the noise is typically referred all to the input. And the reason that is is because all of the transistors in the op amp, what we can do is we can refer, you know, you've got all these different transistors and they all have their own separate noise. But the nice thing about an op amp is you can actually refer all of that noise back to the input. And so all of the noise depends on the gain of the op, op amp. So there's one spec for an op amp. However, there's other components, for example, an instrumentation amplifier where some noise depends on gain and some noise does not. So some, you know, uh, some noise will get gained up if you had a gain of 1,000, uh, then the input referred noise would get gained up, but the output referred noise would not. So in an instrumentation amplifier data sheet, we actually have two specs. We have the input referred noise, or the ENI, uh, and then we have the noise that's independent of gain, which is the ENO. And we have a nice little equation that shows you, depending on what gain you choose, uh, uh, how to combine those different noise sources. But just notice that, that there's these two noise sources instead of one. I think that confuses some folks. And here I've got a little example from our 8221 uh, data sheet that shows, for example, the ENI, or this noise that's dependent on gain, is 8 nanovolts per hertz. And the noise that's independent of gain is 75 nanovolts per hertz. So for example, in a, in a gain of 1, uh, that output noise is going to totally dominate and your noise of your amplifier is going to be very close to 75 nanovolts per hertz. But if you have a high gain, then that output voltage noise goes away and you're just left with the input voltage noise and it's dominated by that 8 nanovolts per hertz. The other component of amplifier voltage noise is current noise. And you can see some units, how that's typically spec, femtoamps per hertz, picoamps RMS, picoamps peak to peak. And you can model this as a, a current source at each of the inputs. Uh, and you see here an example from my A295 data sheet, how it's typically specified in the data sheet. And the reason that current noise is important is because that current flows through resistance at the inputs. So typically, when you are figuring out the voltage for a signal chain, uh, you want to do everything in the same, or when you're figuring out the noise for a signal chain, you want to do everything in uh, the same units, which are typically, say, volts, typically volts RMS. Uh, so the first thing that you do is you go convert all of these currents into voltages. And you do that by multiplying the current by the resistance at the inputs. So there's two cases where you'll have resistance at the inputs. One is when you have a source resistance. So you just multiply that current by the source resistance. Uh, and the other case is when you have a feedback network. And so you multiply that current by the parallel combination of the feedback network. We talked about resistor noise. We talked about amplifier noise. And the next thing we want to talk about is ADC noise. Now, sometimes ADC noise, uh, they make it easy for you, and they put it in uh, volts RMS. So just like what we've talked about on, on uh, some of the other data sheets, that, that stuff is in volts. But most of the time, it's specified in a ratio. So this ratio is called signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, and what that is is the maximum signal that the ADC can measure uh, over the uh, noise of the ADC. So that's specified in dB. Uh, occasionally, they'll also throw in distortion into this uh, ratio. So they'll do the signal over the noise and the distortion. Uh, if they do that, uh, instead of calling it SNR, it's called SINAD. Um, so use this number to figure out the noise of your system. And the next slide, we'll talk about how to do that. Uh, in the emergency, you can use the little equation that probably a lot of folks know, which is that SNR equals 6 times the bits plus 1.76. Now remember that this gives you your ideal performance of an ADC, not the real performance. Uh, so the real performance of your ADC will be a little worse than this, what this equation tells you. OK, so here's how you convert uh, SNR to microvolts RMS. So I've got an equation there, um, and I think it's pretty straightforward. You can go take a look. Uh, the main thing that I did want to point out when you were uh, talking about AC noise is that when you do this conversion, make sure that everything is RMS. So you know your ratio is your full-scale voltage in RMS over your noise voltage in RMS. Um, 
So I think sometimes folks make the mistake of saying, okay, my ADC range, say, is 2 volts peak to peak, and so I use 2 volts in the equation. And really what you would do is you would use the RMS value of a sine wave going into that 2 volts peak to peak range. So that would be 0 0.707. So we got in a little example there of, of um, how you do the math to go from a 69 dB SNR ADC with a 2 volt input range and figure out what the uh, voltage noise coming out of the ADC would be. Okay, we've thrown around, you've seen a lot of different units in the past few slides. You've seen RMS units, peak to peak, nanovolts per root hertz, and, and I think that uh, sometimes it can be confusing what, you know, why do we have all of these units? Uh, why are they useful? Um, and these units actually correspond to different ways of measuring noise. So there's a, you can measure noise RMS, you can measure it peak to peak, or you can measure the, the spectral density of noise. So we'll talk about uh, what these different units mean. And then we'll also talk about how to convert between the different units. Okay, so let's first talk about peak-to-peak -peak and RMS noise. So if you take a noise signal and you made a histogram of all of the points in the noise si signal, then you would get something that looks like a bell curve. And the more points that you could take, the more smooth, nice-looking the bell curve would be. There's two ways that you can measure this bell curve. So one way you can measure the bell curve is say, I'm going to look at the you know, max point and the min point. So in other words, the outliers of this bell curve. And I'm going to say, what's the, what's the distance between the, this max and the min? Uh, and that's called peak to peak noise. Uh, the other way that I can measure this bell curve is I can say, you know, what's, a standard, what's one standard deviation of this bell curve? And that would correspond to an RMS uh, measurement. And so it's two different ways that you can uh, measure this signal. Now, peak-to-peak -peak note only depends on two points. And this has pros and cons. So the, the pro for only having two points is it's very easy to calculate. I mean, you just go figure out what the minimum point is, you figure out what the maximum point is, and then you subtract the two. But the disadvantage of this measurement is that by only using two points, uh, because noise is this random signal that bounces around all over the place, uh, it you know kind of depends on the luck of the draw what your max and your min are going to be. And the, and the longer that you measure your signal, the more likely that you have a smaller min and a bigger max. So it's not a very reliable measurement because the uh, measurement can vary quite a bit depending on kind of what your noise waveform looked like that day. Um, RMS noise, on the other hand, depends on all the points in uh, the measurement. So you know, you take each point, you square it, you add them all together, you divide by the number of points, you uh, take the square root. So uh, the nice thing about that is, is that you're sort of getting an averaging effect, and that that uh, all you're using all the points, all of your data, to figure out what the strength of your noise signal is, rather than just two of the points of your data. Uh, and this makes the RMS noise measurement much more repeatable, uh, much more accurate. And in fact, the longer that you measure the waveform, the more and more accurate uh, your RMS measurement of the noise gets to be. But of course, the disadvantage of using all the points is that you have to use all the points to do your calculations. So that can be a lengthy computation. Uh, one other thing that I just wanted to point out is that in this slide we say, RMS equals standard deviation. And the, the reason that we can do this, this isn't exactly true. Um, so the reason we can do this is because the noise signal typically has a mean of zero. So if you have an average, if you have a signal whose average is zero, then the RMS and the standard deviation are exactly the same. If you had a signal that did not have a mean of zero, uh, say some sort of signal that you're generating, then the uh, RMS and the mean, uh, RMS and the standard deviation are not the same. So just wanted to make sure that that's clear to everyone. But for noise, they are the same. Now, one thing to note when you're using RMS or peak-to-peak -peak numbers is that these numbers vary quite a bit on bandwidth. So what I did is I went into the lab and I took one of our instrumentation parts, the uh, instrumentation amplifier parts, the 8222, and I put it in a specific gain. And then I measured that part at that gain uh, at three different bandwidths. And so you can see the result here. Uh, 
So I measured it at 10 hertz, 100 hertz, and 1,000 hertz. And you can see the big difference in the peak-to-peak -peak, uh, strength of these different signals. And if you were to measure the RMS strength of these different signals, you'd also see a big difference. Um, so remember this when you're using RMS or peak-to-peak -peak numbers, that it really depends on how much your bandwidth is. And so when you're measuring, there's two things to watch out for. One is you need to know the bandwidth of your actual circuit. Uh, and the other thing is that you need to make sure that your measurement instrument uh, has more bandwidth than your circuit that you're measuring. And uh, this can be particularly a problem when you're using a DMM to take an RMS measurement. So, you know, it's very handy to use a DMM because you just switch it into that um, AC voltage mode and bam, there you go, you got the RMS measurement tool. But just be careful. Um, because that DMM may not have the bandwidth that's required for your circuit, and you may get a very faulty answer. Um, typically with an oscilloscope, a lot of the modern oscilloscopes have some sort of RMS measurement where they do some calculation based on the waveform they acquire, and so you don't have that bandwidth issue. So that's what to worry about when you're measuring. And then when you're specifying, of course, you need to actually say, here's the bandwidth that we used when we made this measurement. And you'll notice that uh, in our data sheets, when we spec peak-to-peak -peak numbers, we always have this frequency band, which is almost always 0.1 hertz to 10 hertz, um, that shows you exactly what the uh, frequency band was. The other way that you can measure noise is spectral noise density. And this is a different way of looking at noise. So in, instead of looking at it in the time domain that we've been looking at it before, now we're going to look at it in the frequency domain. Uh, another way you can sort of look at this is if if you were to take uh, one hertz snapshots of uh, your your system. So for example, uh, you have your system and you measured it. You put a filter on it that went from one kilohertz to one kilohertz plus one, and you took a snapshot. And then you took a took a filter from one kilohertz plus one to one kilohertz plus two, and you took a snapshot. Um, so if you did, if you took all of these different RMS readings at these different one hertz bins, then you would end up with a picture just like this. Uh, so that's another way to look at it. Um, <clears throat> the units of spectral noise density are nanovolts per hertz, or if you're doing current, it's femtoamps per hertz. And the nice thing about spectral noise density is that it tends to be pretty accurate because in order to get a nice looking graph like we have here on the A295 data sheet, uh, we had to take a lot of measurements. So this, there is probably millions of millions of points of data that underlie uh, this plot that you're looking at here. And so you can, unlike, say, a peak-to-peak -peak measurement or even an RMS measurement over a short period of time uh, that can have some variations, typically your spectral noise density is measured over a long period of time with lots of data. Uh, and so can, you know, if, you, if it's got a nice smooth characteristic like this, uh, then you can rely on it to 